Um, well, uh, for starters, I, I was surprised to know that uh, UJB, you do a lot. You, you help software companies better satisfy their customers and the, their business. You travel the world sharing what uh, you've learned about programming, managing the workflow, designing the lifestyle, a lot of things. But one of the things that, that surprised me was that your company is called Yaspar Software Services. And uh, as a person who just this weekend finished City and the Stars by Arthur C. Clarke, I have to say, is this that Diaspar? Yeah? Yes, it is. Well, this is a really cool name. Congratulations. <laughs> then. You're the first person in 20 years to notice that. Oh, I think I'm, I'm special. And tell me. <laughs> well, well um, I must say, again, really cool name. Uh, happy to meet a fellow uh, sci-fi fan. Um, I wanted to ask about your session today. So you're going to talk about the definitive guide to mock objects. And... Uh, I know a long, long time ago when I first started unit testing, exactly as you say, at the beginning, I was really afraid of mock objects. Then I started overusing them everywhere and nothing was simple anymore. And right now I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to touch them at times, but then I find them quite useful. Uh, is this your experience too or how, what? Yes, and that's actually what, I, that's a perfect uh, lead in. That's exactly where I'd like to start. Oh, well. Then please go ahead. <laughs> All right. So thanks very much. It's great to uh, to get a chance to participate here today. Uh, this is how you can find me. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, as you saw maybe on the screen, uh, if you'd like to ask a question after today, then you can always visit ask.jbrainings.ca. And if you wait long enough, uh, I'll answer the question and that service is free. So uh, yes, this is the definitive guide to mock objects. If any of you out there are Calvin and Hobbes fans, then you'll recognize that the word definitive there, I'm using it ironically, just in the same way that the big collections of Calvin and Hobbes comics were, you know, the authoritative and the essential and so on. I will, I, I will claim in some way that this is a definitive guide to mock objects. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is to share nearly 20 years of experience in working with mock objects, seeing other people, teaching other people try to do it, understanding the problems that they uh, ran into, the concerns that they have, and to provide something a little bit for everyone. And so what I'm really hoping will happen is to give you um, a more hopeful view of what it's like to work with mock objects, to give you some liberating constraints and helpful guidelines um, rather than just, you know, I always like to combine a high level overview with some concrete steps to get started. So that's what I plan to do today. And by the end of this, uh, you should be able to decide for yourself whether you want or indeed need to learn more. So let's get on the same page first. Um, let's start with uh, some terms. I'll try to get through this relatively quickly because uh, it would be very easy to spend, and in fact, I can remember at past conferences, spending entire nights debating about some of the terms involved. So first, um, I'm going to stop saying mock objects, and I'm going to instead say test doubles. And if you're not familiar with this term, uh, you can think of the concept of a stunt double. That's the person whose job is to stand in for the actor uh, and do stunts, because if the actor tried to do the stunts, then it might kill them and your film is over. And so the idea of test doubles, this was a term that arose because people were confused about what mock objects meant because we were using them in different ways. And there are essentially two broad categories of test doubles. One of them is in this family of stub, fake, dummy, crash, tummy, crash test, dummy, null object. These are the test doubles whose job is to return a hard-coded result from a function that makes the test convenient, is to simulate a function that returns a value in a bunch of different ways. And I've settled on the word stub as my standard usage, taking my cue from the uh, London folks who kind of set the standard for me in all this. But any of these terms are similar. The crash test dummy is a stub that always throws an exception. So it's the one that's, that you can use uh, when you want to test what happens when something goes horribly wrong. And then the other category are the ones where your intention is to capture a side effect. And so I use the term expectation, spy, log string, collecting parameters. These are all different ways of doing that. 
And this, when you talk about a mock, or when many people talk about a mock, they mean this. The problem is that expectation isn't a very good for a verb. I mean, you can use the verb expect, but it's hard to call something an expect. So I tend to use stub and mock both as verbs and nouns, where mock means expect. Old habits die hard. So I distinguish, the last thing that's important is I distinguish a test double from a lightweight implementation. I'll come back to this a bit later if there's time, but the very short version is that a lightweight implementation is a real thing, just lighter. It doesn't always go to a file system or a network or do the real thing, but it acts like the real thing in a lighter way. Whereas a test double doesn't even try to, to act like the real thing. It doesn't try to do what the real thing does. It's a purely cardboard cutout simulation of the real thing. And that's really the key point. A test double stands in for the real thing in order to make something easier. And what that something is, is something you have to decide. And really that's kind of the, the key place where I wanted to start today. So let's, let's now go to iteration one. Uh, as I said, I hope this will be enough to be helpful even if it's not enough to be convincing. It's not my goal to convince you that my way is the right way. It's not even my goal to convince you to try to do what I do. But if you notice some problems that I mentioned and some solutions that sound interesting, then maybe this will be enough to help you get started. So there are generally speaking three ways to use test doubles. The first, the most common place where people start is to stand in for expensive external resources, right? You don't want in the 20 years ago, the biggest expensive external resource in the programmer's life was the database the central database that ran locally, that was the center of the universe of the system. And that was the most common thing to want to use a test double for was so that you could uh, simulate queries and, and um, capture uh, issuing requests to update without having to go round trip to the database. Because of course, going round trip to the database, to the file system, to a network, to any of those things makes your tests slower. And so the place where most people get their introduction to test doubles is to try to make their tests run more quickly by having these test doubles stand in for expensive external resources. The second key way to use test doubles is to use it so that you can build the client, and I mean client not in the client server sense, but more in, this, in the sense that there are, you know, everywhere there are two modules in your system talking to each other, two classes, two functions, whatever. Um, one of them is a client and the other is a supplier or a collaborator. And the idea here is that we can build the client without committing to the collaborator's design. What it allows us to do is to not just think about how we want the client to be, but to actually start building it even before we've committed to design choices and implementation details in the collaborators. And the third way to use test doubles is to detect and break unhealthy dependencies with more confidence. Um, I, one of the, the, the biggest things that I learned to do over time with test doubles was to use them as a way to show when uh, an unhealthy dependency had come into my design so that I could at least notice it sooner and then make a conscious decision whether to deal with it now, to deal with it later, or to let it be as it is. And so that's to me one of the, the primary motivations, the primary uses of test doubles. And the reason that I mentioned these three is that um, this sort of represents a very rough um, path that many programmers seem to take. They tend to start with focusing on test doubles as a way of making their tests run faster. Then they start to use test doubles as a way to help them build one part of the system without having to build the entire cluster of things together at once. And then eventually they start to really see test doubles as the canary in the coal mine, as the signal that something might be going wrong in the design. Now the catch is, and the thing that makes, you know, uh, Vlad mentioned that one of the, the reasons why he felt reluctant to use uh, test doubles is that you start to, you know, if you think they're good, you use them everywhere. That's the extreme programming way, right? If it's good, then let's try doing it all the time and see if that's better. Um, and that's a good thing, except that when you start to feel like perhaps test doubles are making things worse or they're not working in this area, they're not working in this area, or it's starting to feel really strange. I'm copying and pasting a lot of stuff and, and the benefits seem to be sort of eroding over time. The problem is that programmers have a tendency not to notice the signals that the test doubles are providing them about the design of the production code. And that's what leads to the kinds of arguments, fights, 
the, the, the articles online, mock objects suck. I can't believe I, anybody uses these things. I'm never going to use them again in my entire life. Um, they come from, I think they come from programmers failing to notice and failing to respond to the signals that those test doubles are providing. So part of what I wanted to do today is to give you some of those signals to help you become more aware of that and to help you uh, sort of use the signals that test doubles are, are giving you um, as a benefit rather than as a source of chaos. So we can use test doubles to make testing easier. And if you just, if you start there, that works great. If you stop there, over time, mess, messes will accumulate. You need to eventually turn your attention to design feedback. Otherwise, you will end up in the situation that I see with many clients where there are test doubles everywhere. And uh, many of the programmers have no idea why they're there, what they're doing, how it's helpful, or how to cope. They just keep copying and pasting and copying and pasting from one test to the next. So here's a quick overview of designing with test doubles. Once you get past the stage of merely using test doubles as a way to make your tests go faster, then you can look at things like mocking roles, not objects. Uh, and remember, roles are just interfaces. Uh, you'll need to know that mocks aren't stubs and that's Martin Fowler's famous article, but also that stubs aren't mocks, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, a lot of people know me, if they know me at all, they know me for uh, my talk, integrated tests are a scam. And I try to avoid, I avoid the integrated test scam by using a combination of collaboration and contract tests. And Martin Fowler has helped popularize the notion of contract tests uh, by putting the words consumer driven in front of them and then suddenly uh, making them popular in a way that I never could. I'm not bitter. Uh, but you'll notice that here, practice for client first design with test doubles sounds an awful lot like consumer driven contract tests. The two approaches are very, very similar to each other. So we can also use test doubles to start fixing unhealthy dependencies. And I'll show you a few mechanical refactorings that you can do that will help you achieve that. Now, there are also a few little things, you know, while you're learning how to make the bigger changes to the way you think about using test doubles as a design tool, there are a bunch of little things that you can do that can help nudge you in, the, in a, a fruitful direction. So for example, if you've heard the, the idea of one assertion per test, then I encourage you to experiment with one expectation per test, since after all, expectations are really just assertions. I, I offer you the idea that if you think you hate test doubles, you don't, you hate side effects. And that's certainly related to the ongoing and intensifying debate between object-oriented programming and functional programming. And indeed, test doubles don't entirely disappear in functional programming. They just look different. And in some ways, they look simpler. Um, at a minimum, if you notice that you're at work, you're, the, the code bases that you're working in, if you notice that, some, that uh, a test is stubbing something to return another test double, that's a sign of a problem. That's a sign of, a, that's one of those signals that many programmers do not take seriously enough. And when they start taking that uh, signal seriously, good things happen in their design. And in particular, Definitely don't stub X in order to return a stub Y so that you can then expect Z. Uh, when you have long chains of test doubles returning, test doubles returning, test doubles returning, test doubles, something's gone horribly wrong. So test doubles are trying to tell you something. When you start to feel pain and suffering trying to use test doubles in your real projects, those test doubles are trying to tell you something. Before you throw them away, before you get upset, throw your hands up and just flip a table and walk out. I encourage you to take some time to learn to listen to what your test doubles are telling you. All right, so now let's get into the, some of the details. And there can be a little bit of a feeling like, you know, that overview was maybe a little bit too easy. Um, and there's a lot to talk about. And I, I promise you, it, we could do this for hours but I only have 30 minutes and I would like to answer some of your questions directly. So I have tried to do the responsible uh, lightweight software development uh, project management thing and to put what I think is the most important stuff at the beginning so that if we run short on time, well, at least you got, at least we maximized value. I think I read that in the book somewhere. 
If you are uh, unsure about something and you don't want to ask your question here, or even if you do want to ask your question here, I encourage you, if you have some index cards with you, like I do, uh, or a paper or whatever, when a question or a disagreement pops up, write down five words that will remind you and come back here so that you're not waiting 25 or 30 minutes to remember the question you want to ask or the, uh, the specific words you want to yell at me. And if you want to yell those words at me later in the future, feel free. So uh, I call myself the code whisperer, another one of those marketing overhype jokes. Uh, but I called myself this because um, I think your code is trying to tell you something. The way that I tend to approach design in general is that I follow a handful of small rules that allow that uh, tell me what to pay attention to in my design. And then when the design starts to feel pain, it starts to cry. And if I can learn to understand those cries, then I can figure out how to improve the design. And I think that your test doubles are doing something similar. They are trying to help you see where to refactor. They're drawing your attention to something that you might look at. So the first, one of the first resources that I like to draw your attention to is a paper from 2004 called Mock Roles, Not Objects. I just, I, I, I usually don't like to do this, but in this case, I'll make an exception. If you turn your attention to the abstract, it says, uh, it turns out to be, a less, to be less interesting as a technique, in other words, using mock objects as a way of replacing expensive external resources. This turns out to be a less interesting technique for isolating tests from third party libraries than is widely thought. This paper describes the process of using mock objects, test doubles, with an extended example and reports best and worst practices gained from the experience of applying the process. The idea here is that uh, these four folks wrote up a group's experience in recognizing that although they started trying to use test doubles as a way of just standing in for expensive external resources, they soon realized that there was so much more potential for test doubles as a way of giving them clues about emerging types in their system, and especially working in a language like Java with a compile time type checker, this gave them, they noticed, they discovered as they went along that they could discover a lot more and get more useful feedback about the design of their system than merely making their tests go faster. And so the primary uh, things that I remember from this paper, uh, first keep in mind that roles are really just interfaces, protocols, in Ruby we call them modules, um, that these are in C++, these are abstract, purely abstract classes. These are um, abstract data types and, abs uh, uh, and abstract service contracts. And programming to interfaces, which has been around since the 1950s, you can read papers going all the way back to 1950, I think 1958 is the earliest I've seen. Programming to interfaces can be extended and we can think of it as designing with test doubles. If programming to interfaces feels weird to you, and designing and using test doubles feels more concrete, then you can always start by designing with test doubles and you'll get 90% of the benefit of programming the interfaces. And remember that in languages like Python, PHP, JavaScript, Ruby, everything is an interface all the time. I feel a little bit like I was in the right place at the right time learning about this stuff in the early 2000s. In the beginning, we had mockobjects.org, which was a project with handwritten test doubles for everything in the Java standard libraries. And you can imagine the ridiculous amount of code duplication there was in there, especially for expectations, because every expectation boils down to, uh, let me have a counter to remember if anybody called me. Let me remember the parameters that were called, uh, that were sent when we called this method, so that the test could then inquire about that and check that the correct method was called at the right time with the right parameters. And then Java 1.3 came around and we had dynamic method invocation where you could intercept a method call on an interface with a, generic inter with a generic API that allowed you to use reflection to essentially implement an interface without writing a compile time class that implemented the interface. And a whole bunch of that uh, code duplication went away. But in the beginning, dynamic method invocation only worked on interfaces in Java. And then years later, with bytecode generation libraries, it became possible to have dynamic test doubles for concrete classes so that you could write a test double that stood in for anything without having to write a compiled time class that implements the same interface or that extends from that class. 
the one of the reasons why I think that was helpful for me is that it helped it forced me one of the few times I'll say forced it forced me to establish the habit of using test doubles only for interfaces and that uh, this is one of those things that I can tell you from my experience. And if you don't believe me, the only thing I can tell you to do is go try it both ways and measure for yourself. I notice when I step into code bases with clients that one of the biggest problems they have related to test doubles is when they start using test doubles for concrete classes and that entrenches, it encourages them. It solidifies hardwired dependencies and implementation details. One of the nice things about, about accepting this constraint, only using test doubles for interfaces, is that it encourages us to only to depend on an abstract concept of the other thing rather than the implementation details of the other thing. The, the real risk to depending on directly on implementation details is that there might be an implementation detail in that thing that they never guaranteed would work that way and that they feel like they have freedom to change and they don't expect it to affect anyone. If you volunteer to depend on that thing that might change, then when that thing changes with almost no advance notice, you're in trouble. If instead you put an interface in between, then that allows you to, uh, to manage the change happening on both sides of the contract more easily. When you let hardware dependencies and implementation details sit there for longer, this tends to turn code into legacy code painfully quickly. And so one of the constraints that I recommend is let's just use uh, test doubles only for interfaces. Now this reminds me of one of my liberating principles, which is it's totally okay for you to have only one active production implementation for an interface. I don't know why this bothers people. Uh, the point of the interface is not only to allow flexible uh, changes in implementation in production code, but to also um, to mark the places where you are specifically saying, I don't want to risk depending on implementation details. I want to document very clearly which, uh, which things I feel comfortable depending on. In languages like Java, you do this with an interface type, but in languages like PHP or Python, you do this with documentation. Keep in mind that the test doubles themselves are other implementations of the interface. It just so happens that most of the time, the other implementations that we use are only in our tests. I don't see a problem with that. But one of the other things that came from this paper, maybe the single most important thing that came from this paper, not important, the single most immediately helpful thing that came from this paper is don't mock objects, you, or don't mock types that you don't own. I prefer to frame that as positive advice. So only use test doubles for types that you can change. One of the benefits, uh, the deeper benefits of test doubles, that this is the thing that came out of this paper and that also come out of my experience, is that when tests feel strange and feeling strange is the kind of thing that you sort of learn over time, uh, you want to change, I, when I start to feel strange, especially test doubles, they, they sort of start to feel strange quickly. When that happens, that's a signal to me to reconsider the design and consider changing it. Now, when it's a type that I own, then that feedback is helpful to me. But when it's a type that I don't own, if it's an interface in someone else's library in some third party thing that I depend on, or an interface that some other team in the organization insists on owning, then getting feedback about how crappy that interface design is doesn't help me. In fact, it makes me feel worse. It just makes me feel powerless to change what I need to change. And so when you use test doubles for only types that you can change, the design feedback that you get becomes useful instead of a constant reminder that things are bad and you can't change them. And so here's a picture of what that looks like. So you can, let's wait, do I point? Yeah, so in the center there, you can see that little class, the rectangle, which talks to the horrible gelatinous blob, which is some third party thing that you don't want to depend on directly. And even if that horrible gelatinous blob Ex export some of its behavior through interfaces. If you try to use those interfaces directly and those interfaces annoy you in some way, you can't do anything about them. But what you can do is introduce an adapter in the middle whose job is to talk to those annoying interfaces and present it in a way that better fits the way that your stuff is going to use it. Your stuff is that nice green fluffy cloud up there with a happy face. And 
you can design an interface that more directly describes how you're going to use the horrible gelatinous blob. And the adapter's job is to convert their annoying interface into your beautiful interface. And I will use the test doubles to help simulate the adapter. And that is how I hide the rest of what's going on behind the scenes. So that everything in the fluffy cloud, except for the entry point of the system, has no idea that that horrible gelatinous blob is even there. And there's a wonderful article by Matteo Vaccari called How I Learned to Love Mock Objects in which he shows an example of how to do this, uh, by the way, using more of a lightweight implementation than test doubles, but the principle is the same, that the interface that you try to simulate with test doubles uh, drastically affects the quality of your experience and the quality of the design feedback. So when you feel the impulse to use a test double for a concrete class, sometimes it feels wrong to extract an interface from that class. You know, one of the things that I agree with the senior programmers who complain about having an interface for everything, not everything needs an interface. But if I have the impulse to use the test double for a concrete class because I don't want to integrate with it directly, but I want to simulate it somehow, and it feels wrong to extract an interface from that class, then that's the signal. The contradiction between those two things is the signal to me that something is wrong. And in particular, it's a sign that maybe there are too many responsibilities in the same place that there's some aspect of this class's behavior that if I could extract it into a separate class, I would feel very comfortable extracting the interface from it. That's one of the ways in which, in which the annoyance of using test doubles becomes helpful. That uh, the symptom is I need to use a test double for that thing, but I don't want to extract an interface from it. How do I resolve the conflict? And the simplest way to resolve the conflict is to split that class into two parts. The part where it makes sense to extract an interface and the rest, and one will talk to the other, and the rest will talk to both, and the design probably gets a little bit better. Almost always for most people most of the time. So here's another liberating principle. When you want to use a test double, what that means is, I want to depend on the contract of that thing, but I don't want to risk depending on its implementation details. Now, if it seems odd to then move everything around so that you can extract an interface for, from it, I understand why that feels odd, but doesn't it feel odder? Doesn't it feel even more risky to volunteer to hardwire dependency on implementation details when all you care about is some small part of the interface? It seems like the second problem is, or the second risk is worse than the first. And this is another one of those things where I kind of have to say, well, you just kind of have to get used to it. Once you do it for a while, the wisdom of it becomes apparent. If you want an interface, or if you want to use a test double, you almost certainly want to use an interface. So just extract one. And if you're working in a language where there's no such thing as extracting one, then document it. Um, you know, using a pro, uh, well, I asked old small talk programmers, what do you do in small talk when you, there's no interface type for you to extract? They said, we just write stuff down. Sounds like a good idea to me. So when is it safe to introduce test doubles? Well, if you know these three terms from domain-driven design, here's a simple um, summary. Uh, if, your, if your object is a service, it's almost always safe to introduce a test double for it, meaning extract the interface. Entities, sometimes. Values, almost never. If you want to extract an interface for a value, something might be horribly wrong. And if you want details, there's an article by that exact name. Go find it. And uh, you can read the details and get some of the um, uh, some of my uh, defense of the argument. Now, Martin Fowler wrote this wonderful article called "Mocks Aren't Stubs," which addressed the idea of one of the biggest mistakes that programmers make when they use test doubles is they use expectations everywhere, even when they're not trying to detect a side effect. And so, one of the uh, this was something that the mock the um, Mock roles, not objects, folks. Uh, Steve Freeman and Nat Price put in their book, Growing Object uh, Oriented Systems Guided by Tests. Sorry, software, not systems. Um, and I have, as I've been teaching this, I found the nice pithy phrase, stub queries expect actions. And so queries are functions that return a result where usually you're not, you're, you, you only care about the function as a provider of data, but you don't care when somebody asked for that data. You just know that something is going to ask for this data, and at that moment, when you ask for this data, return 38. 
Stubbing queries uh, tends to allow more flexibility because the implementation details of queries tends to change more over time. Uh, it affects more how you actually do the query, what the SQL command looks like, or what the GraphQL command looks like, or whatever technology you're using for querying your data might change. But the overall contract of I'll give you a customer ID and you give me the corresponding customer object is very stable. So most of the time we don't want to expect queries. That's over specifying the test, which makes the tests feel brittle, which gives you the impression that you're testing implementation details, which makes you then want to flip a table and throw mock objects away. If you stop queries, that allows you to keep flexibility. Instead, use expectations for actions, for side effects. Uh, an action in a test, or sorry, an, expect, an expected action in a test is the point of the test. I wanna make sure I fire this event. I wanna make sure that I, that I request this update. I wanna make sure that I try to format this report. The essentially stub inputs and expect outputs. That's one of the things, one of the simplest things that you can do right now is go back to your code base that uses lots of test doubles, look for places where you're using expectations, try replacing them with stubs, and all of a sudden, your test will become a lot less brittle. Now, at the same time, stubs aren't mocks. This is the article that Martin Fowler hasn't written yet. Don't, many people, when they go through the mocks aren't stubs phase, they say to themselves, I'm never going to use expectations again. Stop. There's nothing wrong with expectations if you use them only when you need them. When the focus of the test is making sure that that action was requested on that interface over there, then expectations are absolutely the right tool. And some people, even well-respected programmers who I consider my peers, will often go through torturous hoops to avoid using expectations and will instead do something strange like stubbing the interface that has the action they care about and then making it, you know, changing the action to return a value and then simulating the value that it returns just so that they can check the value to verify that they indirectly verify that they called the, the method. Look, if the purpose of your test is to verify that you called that function, that you fired this event with these parameters, don't use stubs to check that indirectly. If that's the purpose of the test, then just make that the test. That's what expectations are for. And if you really don't like it, then you can always do the mechanical refactoring of replacing a side effect with a return value. And if you're not familiar with that mechanical refactoring, then look at some functional programming code bases and you'll notice that instead of, instead of uh, side effects, they have a tendency to then compute a return value, which is the command to execute next. You can do that in Java and C-sharp just as easily as you can do it in Elm and Haskell. What I've noticed that happens over time is that if I don't like that I'm putting an expectation on a function, if I turn it into an event, then that tends to make the whole thing, the design tends to make more sense. And that is another expression of the idea of programming to abstractions. Over time, as you write code, as you create functions, in the beginning, you tend to think of the function based on how it does things. And then over time, you start to be more interested in what it does and not how it does it. That's raising the level of abstraction one little bit. But then gradually, you can even replace that with either when am I going to call this function or why would I call this function? This is what Kent Beck talked about uh, or meant by revealing intent. Gradually over time, we replace implementation details with a description of at least the contract and maybe even better, the purpose. Test doubles help me move in that direction. All right, so since we're getting low on time, I'm gonna to try to go, a little, I'm gonna switch to a more summary level. Uh, anyone who wants to ask questions about this stuff is welcome to do so, and I'm always happy to answer. Um, integrated tests are a scam, so use collaboration and contract tests instead. There's no reason to go through the entire thing because you can just watch it online. And certainly we're not gonna watch it now. And I apologize for the lighting. Eventually I will record another version of this, but this is the best that we have available at the time. One of the key techniques that I learned from Atomic Object was presenter first design. And I have, um, when I teach it to others, I um, abstract it away to something I call client first design with test doubles. This is very, uh, very closely related to the book, Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. They're very similar techniques. In fact, you might say the same, just different uh, ways of framing it. This is also known as the so-called London School of Test Driven Development. The basic idea is that as you build, you start with the entry point of your feature, 
And any time that you want to use something, but you don't care about how to build it yet, you put an interface there. Every time I say in my test, I need something that does X, or I need to tell something to do X, the word something means interface. And so I put an interface there that allows me to defer decisions about implementation details to focus on the contracts. I can build my client without committing to design decisions. I can sketch the design decisions for the next layer for my collaborators without having to implement them right away. And the first four or five tests, I might change the interfaces considerably, and then the interfaces start to stabilize and it becomes safe for me to then implement the, uh, those interfaces. Now, the good news is that this is a shortcut compared to the Chicago Detroit school where you sort of throw all the code into a single junk drawer and then you use duplication to figure out when is this code becoming too complicated? Now let me break it up into three or four little pieces that talk to each other. A shortcut is good because you get there faster. A shortcut is bad because you get there faster, even if it's the wrong place. So that kind of leads me to one of the, uh, this, is an ex this is a picture of what that looks like, pardon me. Uh, just take a look at the top half. You have an entry point that talks to a couple of interfaces implemented. Uh, above the interfaces are the collaboration tests where we use test doubles to stand in for the interfaces. And underneath the interfaces are the contract tests that show that the implementations respect the contracts. And the key that makes this work is that in the collaboration tests, whenever we stub a query or expect an action, we write a corresponding contract test that means the same thing. So if I stub a function to return 12, there's a contract test that shows, here's when I return 12. And the only places where I use integrated tests are the places where there's the last little thing that talks to the horrible outside world. I'm not gonna look at the, I'm not gonna talk about the bottom two uh, for now because unfortunately that's too much for the summary level. But here's my bold claim. When I practice client first design with test doubles, that helps me guide, that helps to guide me to design systems organized as microservices within a single process. Everything works as long as the next layer works. And then everything in that layer works as long as the next layer works. What I end up with are these tiny things that talk to each other over well-defined interfaces. And the only integration to the horrible outside world happens at the very edges. Like I said, this helps me create microservices within a single process. If you get good at that, then when you distribute those microservices, that turns out to be a lot easier. So the reverse is true. If you're having trouble with distributed microservices, maybe the problem is that you don't know how to do microservices in a single process yet. Client first design with test doubles helps move in that direction. And that brings me to the last big thing I wanna talk about, which is the universal architecture. Honestly, this could be a two hour talk on its own. In fact, when I do this in my training courses, it takes about an hour to go through all the details. But the short version is that there are three categories of code, the happy zone, the horrible outside world, and the DMZ. The happy zone is mostly value objects and interfaces. It's the stuff that runs entirely in memory that's really, that where the tests run really fast and it's very easy to change things. You have control over what's in there. You can change it when you need it. And whenever you use that stuff, it makes you happy. The horrible outside world is horrible for a reason, but it's also where all the interesting stuff is. So the good news about the horrible outside world is that's where all the valuable stuff is. Other people's computers, file systems, networks, all that good stuff. The bad news is that's, that's where the annoying stuff is and the interesting stuff. And the point of integrated tests or a scam is not to get rid of integrated tests, but to limit integrated tests to that blue dotted oval, the only place where I use integrated tests. And so the green arrows tell you where it's safe for code to depend on other code. And the red arrows are where it's unsafe for code to depend on other code. Those two red arrows are the cause of most of your pain and suffering. And so if we look at the red arrow on the left, closer to me, you can see two little pointers to two other green arrows. If we replace that red arrow with the green arrow to its left, that's applying the dependency inversion principle in the functional programming way. And so functional programming folks are accustomed to doing that. That's where you use patterns like logic sandwich and so on. But the object-oriented folks might be more familiar with doing it the other way, the arrow to its right. The two green arrows there, that's where you take the class that's in the DMZ, extract an interface from it, let the happy zone depend mostly on that interface, in fact, entirely on that interface, and you've replaced one red arrow with two green arrows. And what that does is it gives you more uh, options to refactor later. Once you move code into the happy zone, it's safer, easier, and less costly to refactor further. 
And the same is true for the big long, that long red arrow, if you put that long, sorry, that long red arrow in code and you think that's okay, then I have to fire you. That is the source of most of your pain and suffering. And you can do exactly the same thing. You can either apply the dependency inversion principle, and that's switching it to the green arrow to its left, or you can use the green arrow sort of at the three o'clock position in the diagram. That's exactly the same set of green arrows that Matteo Vaccari used in his article, How I Lo Learned to Love Mock Objects. The idea here is extracting an interface allows us to use test doubles, which allows us to focus tests on, I'm building this part and I only care about simulating the rest. Those red arrows hurt you in one very important way. When you try to write tests for the code that should be in the happy zone, you're forced to run the crappy runtime container that lives in the horrible outside world. And that's what makes your tests get slower and slower and slower. And that's where the integrated test scam comes from. By applying these refactorings over and over again, you limit the number of integrated tests to just that blue oval. And over time, the way this works is that we tend to add code. So this is the stuff at the nine o'clock position of the diagram. We tend to add code in the DMZ in order to get it working and then refactor code by extracting interfaces, inverting dependencies and moving code into the DM, into the happy zone. And if you keep doing that over time, that's what makes the code, uh, let's say that's what uh, dampens the acceleration of your code base towards heat death, where the cost of throwing it away and starting again seems less than the cost of continuing. If you let re red arrows continue, they march you to your grave. If you turn them into green arrows, then your code base stays, stays healthier longer. And test doubles are one of the ingredients that helps you get there. So replace red arrows with green arrows. Those are mechanical refactorings. I can replace a red arrow with a green arrow even if I don't understand your system, as long as I understand your uh, programming language. Now, I'm not gonna come up with a good name for the interface. That's your job. You who live in the code can do that. But you can point me at literally any code base in a language I understand, and I can turn red arrows into green arrows. And that doesn't necessarily improve the design right away, but it gives us more options to refactor in a way that actually improves the design that reveals more intent. And by the way, if you do that, that pushes you uh, not so gently in the direction of the functional core imperative shell design. In fact, you might recognize this as an abstraction of the various kinds of architecture uh, suggestions that some of my good friends and colleagues recommend, like the onion architecture, the hexagonal architecture, and ports and adapters. So pointless debate number one, should we use the London School approach of TD or the Chicago Detroit School of TD? Eh, whatever makes you happy. I won't go through this example uh, because there are only two minutes left and I apologize. I know I dislike it when, a, when a, uh, a speaker does this, maybe your subconscious mind will just notice these diagrams and it, you know, system one is doing the work right now. And I promise you that anyone who wants to know more about this can ask me and I will, I'll put a video up or something about it. But the, the concrete benefit from that stuff that I didn't explain um, is that if you aim for at most one expectation per test, it tends to nudge you in the direction of noticing when the interaction between this thing and that thing is too fine-grained. When you notice that you are calling too many different methods on the same object or on a handful of different objects, let's say interfaces now, uh, and that forces you to set expectations on this thing, then this thing, then we have to call that method, then we have to call that method, then we have to call that method, these parameters, that might be okay in small doses, but if you copy and paste that to other parts of the system, then that causes pain and suffering. If you try for one expectation per test, it will help you detect when this is happening and it will encourage you to raise the level of abstraction to notice when the interaction between the client and the supplier is too fine grained, too low level, and when it's better to use that refactoring that Matteo shows in his article uh, how I learned to love mock objects.
Uh, if you stub a function to return another stub so that you can simulate one of its functions, that's another sign that I know too much about the implementation details of my collaborators, and I want to replace a low-level interface with a higher-level interface. And this is one of these things that makes many people uncomfortable working with mock objects, but they shouldn't. It's okay to collapse a layer if you notice that it's doing more harm than good. Um, rather than talk about this now, I encourage you to find an article uh, about called Functional Programming for Object-Oriented uh, Programmers called, uh, by Simon Harris, uh, which talks about these things. And essentially, the, the bottom line is that we don't need stubs in functional programming. That's just a function that always returns a hard-coded value. And we tend to push side effects up by returning a command value instead of firing an event. But test doubles can help you not set test doubles might not help you do that in Elm, but they might help you move in the direction of a more functional immutable design in Java and C sharp. All right. Try not to use a test double when you really want a lightweight implementation. Try not to use a lightweight implementation when you really want a test double. One of the simplest ways to notice this, oh, and by the way, should you handwrite your test doubles or use a library like EasyMock, JMock, RSpec, Mock, or whatever? Do whatever makes you happy. If you want, use a new test double for every test. If you start to share test double state between tests, especially if you're stubbing, then eventually you're using JMock to build a lightweight implementation. Let me tell you, a test double library is a terrible programming language, but it's a great test double library. Don't use a test double library to build a, a in-memory version of your database or an in-memory version of your mail server. If what you really want is a lightweight implementation, just use one. All right, so quick summary. I could say test doubles instead of mock objects uh, to avoid confusion between mock object, the general concept, and mock object, the expectation. Mock roles, not objects, and mock only the types that you own. Try one expectation for tests. Experiment with that for three months and see where it goes. If, if your test doubles feel weird, then maybe you're using expectations for queries. Instead, stub queries and expect actions. Use collaboration and contract tests instead of integrated tests. Go watch my talk if you want to know more. Mocks aren't stubs and stubs aren't mocks. Use stubs for stubbing and use mocks for expectations. And if you have too many expectations in your test, maybe you need to introduce a new abstraction and collapse a layer. And don't use test doubles to build uh, an in-memory database and don't use a lightweight implementation for your test doubles. Use the tool that fits what you want. Don't stop at using test doubles just to stand in for expensive external resources. Start there, don't stop there. When test doubles make your tests feel weird, change the design until they don't, until they don't. Your test doubles are trying to tell you something. Thanks very much for your time and attention. I apologize for stealing three minutes from the break. Ask me questions if you like uh, at ask.jbrains.ca and I promise you I will eventually answer them. That service is free. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Thank you, JB. No, no worries. We, we also have a couple of questions uh, right now, if you, if you have- Excellent, I'm happy to try to answer them. All right. So first one, uh, is it TDD, hot or not? I don't care. All right. So, and I, and I say that with love, like uh, uh, do it if it's helpful uh, and don't do it if it's not helpful. Um, if you're asking more like, will putting TDD on my CV make it easier for me to find a job? I, I frankly don't know. Um, I type at like 75, 80 words per minute, but I don't put that on my CV because I hope that's not what people are hiring me for. I hope they're hiring me for my overall skill and not just because of the way that I do my job. All right, thank you. I'm, yeah. <laughs> um, Dan, would you like to, to go uh, for the next one? Uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, so there's a question, I'm going to read it fully. So my concern with the contract tests is that I have to manually keep the contract in sync between consumer and provider. I'm worried that I'll make mistakes and the collaboration or contract tests won't fail, unlike integrated tests. Yes, so this is, this is uh, if, you, if you watch my talk, you'll get a seven-year-old answer to that. My answer mostly hasn't changed. Um, the very short version is... Um, I agree with you 
Uh, yes, that is a risk. However, uh, there's a greater risk that I something changes and 137 integrated tests that take four hours to run all fail. And if that happens three times in a two week period, that's when Dan says, I told you all these tests are ridiculous. We should throw them all away and just stop worrying about them entirely. Um, and I think that's a much greater risk to project success than trying to make sure that the contract tests and the collaboration tests match each other. The good news is that there's a systematic way for knowing which contract test I need to correspond to a collaboration test and the other way around is true, right? If I stub a function return 12, then I expect there to be a collaboration test that says, here is the situation that causes me to return 12. Or if in my contract test, I say this function might throw that exception, I better have a collaboration test that says, here is what happens when that thing throws an exception. See, I handle it. And it's true. I don't know any software that helps me uh, keep those things in sync. That's something that we have to do. But I would rather have a systematic way to do that than to do the equivalent of trying to paint a wall by throwing paint from three meters away and hoping that I cover the whole wall. The problem with integrated tests is that we don't know whether our confidence should be this high, this high, or this high. We just sort of hope it's high enough. Uh, which I think is a, uh, it's a, it's a lower risk early in the project and it's fine until one day over the weekend, it suddenly isn't fine. And then we're in real trouble. I would rather avoid that real trouble from the beginning. All right. So it's a trade off and uh, let's say choose the lesser of the evils. Right. right. And, and, and let me, and let me be clear. You can start with integrated tests. Like I do, I start with integrated tests. Uh, when the system is tiny or the feature is very small and there aren't a lot of moving pieces yet. If there are only two or three parts to the system, integrated tests, the risk is low. What happens over time? The, the difficulty comes when people cling to integrated tests as though that were the one true way to solve this problem. And so if you like, um, the talk is a way to snap people to attention and to show them another way to do it. Not that integrated tests are bad in all cases, but that if you stay with them for too long, eventually it will kill you. So you better start learning how to transition away from integrated tests towards collaboration and contract tests now, so that when you need to do it under pressure and you're getting paid for it, it'll feel comfortable. All right, thank you. Uh, Vlad, do you have another yes. question? Present. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we, we have couple more questions actually. Uh, first off would be how much abstraction is too much? Is, is there any, is it turtles or all the way down? So yeah, how much abstraction is too much? Uh, I, I mean, I, I suppose if you notice that there's an abstraction whose only implementation is to talk to the next layer and the language of the next layer is exactly the same as the language of this layer, that's a pretty clear example. Um, and in fact, so the, the very short answer to the question is probably, but no programmer tends to get there. Um, some, some of my colleagues and, and peers and friends uh, tend to say, I would rather have a little bit more duplication and reveal intent better. Um, that, you know, uh, abstractions that I don't understand are worse than not enough abstractions. And maybe that's true, but I think abstraction and code that explains itself is a false dichotomy. The, the whole point is to have abstractions that explain themselves. And if you don't have abstractions, abstractions that explain themselves, then improve names. Um, I don't think we get better at creating well-named reveal, uh, uh, intention revealing abstractions by not practicing. The only way you practice naming things better is to name things poorly and talk about what you don't like about the names with people who care. Uh, and the only way to find out where, how much abstraction is too much abstraction is to abstract too much and talk about why it's a problem. Um, most programmers never get there. Uh, I, I'll take my chances. The bigger problem is that in direction without abstraction. That's the, that's the killer. Okay, so, so basically you wouldn't use something like proxies and call them a different layer. Uh, if all they're doing is acting, so that's the, the difference between middleman and proxy, right? A middleman is a bad proxy and a proxy is a good middleman, a middleman who's providing value. <laughs> so, uh, do you have a proxy or a middleman? 
that's straight out of the design patterns book, right? That's if you read the uh, disadvantages and drawbacks uh, or the alternatives and drawbacks section, that's exactly what they say in that book. That a proxy could be just a middleman who's, you know, it's like the dude from office space that just takes the specification from the customers to the programmers. Um, talking directly isn't always better. If that middleman is providing value, like making remote calls look local, in the case of Corva, then it's providing value. That's a proxy, not a middleman. But if all a middleman is doing is taking a request and handing it on without any changes to it, eh, you've probably abstracted too far. In fact, I'll bet what's happening, you haven't abstracted too far. You put too much in direction and the abstraction is the combination of those two layers. Collapse them and it'll be perfect. All right, I will. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm gonna take the next one then if you don't, uh, if you don't mind, because it's, it's actually a clarification to the TD the question earlier. I think I also right. misrepresented it. So uh, basically it's uh, not, not necessarily, yeah, when it's not necessarily whether or not it's, uh, it's good to be on a CV, but whether or not, yeah, you'd use it uh, in a real life project. Oh, of course. That's, that's, I mean, uh, so the very short version is that I use test-driven development as a way of doing evolutionary design safely, right? That allows me to change the design of the system while I'm building it so that I don't have to figure it all out in my head at the beginning and then write it all down. I feel very comfortable when I notice that some part of the design isn't enough for the new feature. It was okay last week and it needs to change now. I feel TDD was how I practiced being comfortable with doing that. Um, and one of the ways that I like to describe test-driven development in general is it's a mechanism for practicing and understanding what's good about these guiding principles of design. It's sort of the same way that you learn to speak a language, right? You can read books on grammar and you can read dictionaries to learn new words, but at some point you have to go out there and just start speaking the language you look at the picture on the other person's face, they understand you or they don't. And when they don't understand you, you try to figure out how to say it differently in a way that they will understand you. Um, that's part of what test-driven development gives you is this kind of, uh, it's like this, um, this practice room where you get to uh, try out different ideas about how to design the system to solve a problem knowing that if you make a bad choice, it's relatively easy to refactor to a better choice because you've practiced doing that. Now, some people will probably say that if I practice test-driven development long enough, I don't need it anymore. And there's, there's an element of truth to that. I've been doing test-driven development for nearly 20 years as my primary way of writing code. There are lots of situations where I feel confident writing code even if I don't do test-driven development. But those are situations where either the tools are very bad or I am only going to use this code for a couple of days or the cost of failure is only a, a few uh, dollars, correct ones, not the freedom dollars. Uh, it's not going to hurt me if I fail. So I wouldn't necessarily spend the extra time to write tests, but I can tell you that I am writing the tests in my head. And if I ever get into a situation where something goes wrong and I can't figure it out, I immediately start writing tests. So for example, when I work in Elm, I can do a, I can get feedback really quickly just by changing code and refreshing the browser, changing code and refreshing the browser. And the type system gives me lots of, it's like the type system runs a lot of tests for me. And that makes me feel very confident. But if something starts behaving strangely, if I compose a bunch of functions that doesn't seem to be doing what I expect, uh, I'll go into the REPL. And if I can't figure it out in three minutes in the REPL, I start writing tests. And even if I do fix the problem in the REPL, if I'm worried that I'm gonna forget what I learned, I write tests. Because the tests are like REPL sessions that live forever. I can go back and read them again and know what happened. So if you are, if you think you don't need to write tests in order to write code that works, you know, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. Uh, but if you if you feel like I don't have high confidence in being able to write code that does what I want, then writing tests and doing that diligently for months, years, will help you build some amazingly good habits so that when those tests are taken away from you, or when you set them aside, the work you do 
will be better than it ever was before. It's not for everyone, but for most people, most of the time, that tends to happen. Okay, I think that's that's a really good uh, argument, pro or con uh, TDD, depending on uh, you know, yeah what what you want. Plus, yeah, it, it's it's easy to to just get started and try try TDD out and see if it works for you. The most important thing, if you do so, anyone out there who is not sure about whether they want to try TDD, please do not just try it on your own. And I'm not trying to sell my training right now. I promise you. What I'm telling you is. There are online communities out there where you can ask questions and you can especially go to a groups.io group called Test Driven Development, all one word, that is the old Yahoo group. There's 20 years of collected wisdom on doing test driven development in like 140,000 conversations in that message board. And some of the people who used to hang out there in the old days have come back and hang out irregularly, but from time to time. When you're in a situation where your gut tells you to do this, but the rules tell you to do that, and there's a conflict that it feels weird and your stomach gets in knots or you start to feel pain in your chest, that's when you need to ask someone a question who has more experience than you have. It's hard to ask us a question because we like to get paid for that stuff, but there's a collection of people who are sitting there in that group or on Stack Overflow or Quora who are eager to answer your questions. Ask them. Do not just try to learn this stuff on your own. I didn't. There's no reason for you to. And if you want to buy my training, do that too. TDD.training. <laughs> well, that's good to know. All right. Uh, I think um, that's about it with the questions. Uh, thank you, JB. Yeah, we took a bit uh, longer, but since it was the last session of the day, I think it was well worth it and uh, very insightful. Well, and you planned well because you know I never finish on time. So you put me in the correct part of the schedule. That's, <laughs> that's, that's good when, the, when, when people get to know you. Well, that's a, actually, it's uh, let's say, but you did uh, manage in time. As we also started a few minutes late, and uh, yeah, if that were so, it would have been the first time actually. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really cool. Thanks a lot for being here again. Uh, Thanks yeah, very cool. much. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Uh, we hope. Yeah, with any luck, once again in person at some point in the future. Yeah, well, this has its advantages. I mean, uh, it does. we're happy. <laughs>